and uh, so so stick around. But right now we're going to go to speaker view, and please mute yourself. Um, or and and of course I think Diane, who is our um, our kind um, uh, Zoom czar, uh, she will help too. Also, if there's anything happens, if you have any issues with sound or anything, you can uh, write a chat to her. Um, if you write a chat to me, I won't see it because I'll be busy telling stories, but we will have a chance to chat later on. So, okay, everybody, we'll see you a little bit later, and we're going to go to uh, uh, speaker view. Great. Well, I wanted to share a poem with you tonight, uh, which is in honor of a, a warrior. And our protagonist tonight in the main story is Finn McCool, who was both a poet and a warrior. And this is a story actually that was, or rather a poem that was written in honor of another warrior. His name was Lataro. He's a South American warrior. He was a fierce uh, Mapuche uh, Indian warrior. But the reason I love this poem is because even though, even though Lataro and Finn McCool were separated by centuries and oceans and cultures, they were very similar in that they were of what's called the warrior shaman magician tradition. Uh, they lived most of their lives out of doors and it was in the wilds, it was in the wilds that they learned, gained their instincts, their wiles, their strategies. Um, some people said they were shape shifters. They could assume, assume the shapes of, of different animals. But uh, just imagine they lived a long, long time uh, out of doors and both of them were passionate defenders uh, of their people. And so the poem, uh, about Lataro. Lataro was a slender arrow. Supple and blue was our father. His adolescence was authority, his youth an aimed wind. He habituated his feet in icy streams. He schooled his head among the thorns. He slept in the snowdrifts. He scratched secrets from the crags, suckled cold springtime, and burned in infernal gorges. Lotaro made of himself velocity and sudden light. He worked in the invisible haunts. He ate from each fire of his people. He wrested treasure from the waves. He drank wild blood on the roads. He wrested treasure from the waves. And Lotaro, he studied to become a hurricane wind. Lotaro learned the alphabet of lightning. He became like glass of transparent hardness. He deciphered the spiral threads of smoke. He fought himself until his blood was extinguished. He oiled himself like the soul of an olive. He wrapped himself in dark skins. He fought himself until his blood was extinguished because he knew only then was he worthy of his people. And that's from Educación de un Cacique, The Education of a Chieftain by the great Chilean poet Pablo Neruda. And uh, the, the truth is that uh, Lotaro actually was a historical figure. He was the uh, fierce warrior of the Mapuche tribe in Chile. And when the Spaniards attempted to move south across this Bio Bio River, because the land was filled with gold, they planned to conquer the Machu Mapuche and turn them into slaves to take the gold out. That never happened because Lotaro led his people in so many uh, skirmishes and campaigns and ambushes, the Spaniards eventually gave up. And for 150 years, they would not go south of the Bio Bio River, which was the homeland of, of the Mapuche. And so to Lotaro and to Fen and to other warriors that are fighting this day to defend a homeland against a much, much more powerful aggressor to them. Salud. Well, I wanna tell you a couple of stories today and start out with a short one. Um, uh, peddlers were a very important part of Irish society in part because Ireland uh, was main, mainly uh, an island of farmers and herders and shepherds. And there were very few towns in Ireland, especially old Ireland. Uh, people were spread out. They would only come to town on occasion. Um, and so of course you would need stuff at times, you know, uh, you would need, um, you know, a darning needle, uh, a wet stone, a knife, scissors, thread, cloth, something like that. And it was the peddlers that would bring that. 
the peddlers would travel the rocky roads of Ireland far and wide, bringing very useful things to the people. Uh, well, except, except for the peddler, uh, Patrick O'Flaherty. Uh, he pretty much uh, just peddled worthless threadbare scarves and cheap jewelry and trinkets and knickknacks and stuff like that. But you see, he was a, a flatterer and a cajoler, you know? And so uh, he, he would be speaking to a woman and he would say, ah, oh, look at that scarf upon you. Doesn't it match perfectly your eyes and all oh, beautiful, the color of your hair, it's lovely. And don't you know, this particular scarf had belonged to an aristocratic woman down there in County Kerry. And I believe perhaps her luck would wear off upon you if, if you wore it. Now, I'm gonna give it to you for half price today because you're, well, you're such a lovely person. Or to a man, he'd say, now, this ring, you see, didn't it belong? I believe it did belong to a sultan in the Middle East, and perhaps his luck would wear off upon you. I'd like to give it to you as a gift, but because reciprocity is the soul of business, perhaps you could give me a few coins in return. <laughs> Patrick O'Flaherty, well, people would say, um, many people had kissed the Blarney Stone, but Patrick O'Flaherty took a bite out of it and got a chunk of it wedged in his teeth because he would never ever tell the truth if a lie or a half truth would do. And that's sort of how he made his way through the world. And on this particular day, couldn't you see him coming through the town of Donegal there, big as life. And he was uh, you know, tipping his hat to this gentleman and tipping his hat to this woman. And then suddenly he came to a stop because he saw something. It was a broadside, you know, a broadsheet, a poster. And it was tacked to the town hall, the big meeting hall. And it said, Blarney Spouting Contest. Whoever can tell the greatest tale of Blarney in one month's time right here will win a huge pouch of gold. Ha <laughs> ha. And Patrick O'Flaherty immediately thought, the gold, ha <laughs> ha, that's as good as mine. For you say, I can tell stories. I can spout, spout Blarney better than the king of leprechauns himself. Well, that was quite a statement. Well, he left Donegal in the evening and he walked into a valley up a hill, into another valley up another hill. And that's where he saw a beautiful spreading oak tree. And it was getting on towards night. And he laid his head down beneath that tree and he went to sleep. But as he was sleeping, he had this dream. And in the dream, he fell down, 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 right through the earth, just like it was so much air. And he landed... <clears throat> And he opened his eyes and oh, he was in this beautiful room. It had this etheric light, you know. And suddenly he heard the blare of a trumpet and this little door opened and in came a man, an ancient man with a long beard, a bit of a crown on his head. But this man, although he was old, he was only as tall as Patrick O'Flaherty's knee. He was this wee little man. And he said, Patrick O'Flaherty, welcome now to the land of the wee folk. I am the king of the leprechauns himself. And it's such an honor to have you here, Patrick. We've brought you here to give you a gift. For we've so enjoyed all, all your stories and all your tales and, and all the blarney you've been spouting for years, Patrick. And we have a small token of our appreciation. And with that, the king of leprechauns, he took a ring, a gold ring, and he put it on Patrick's finger there, you know. And he said, in gratitude to you, Patrick. And Patrick O'Flaherty, you know, he, he said, well, King, thank you, I'm so grateful. But to himself, of course, he thought, and it is well deserved, you know. And just then the King said, well, Patrick, there's one other thing you need to know. The ring you have in your finger there, it's also known as the ring of truth. And the man who wears it can spout only the truth, can tell no lies, half truth whatsoever. From this day forward, you have to tell nothing but the truth. And with that, with that, Patrick O'Flaherty, he, he woke up. I mean, that was a nightmare to him, you know. And he sat up and, I mean, the dream seemed so real, you know. And he, and he, and he, and he sat up, he leaned against the tree and he was breathing hard. And, and that's when he looked down and what do you think he saw on his finger? The ring. And he thought, no, no, this can't be true. But it was. The next day, as he tried to sell one of those cheap scarves, he, he found himself saying, now this scarf, it would look lovely on you. However, your hair doesn't quite match it, you know, and it is kind of threadbare. It's a rather cheap scarf, but I'd like you to buy it anyway. Would you do that? And so it was. 
they could no longer flatter or cajole or speak as half truths. And so you might say business dropped off precipitously. And after a while, he was destitute. He didn't know what to do, wandering around, you know. And it just so happened, it just so happened one day, he wandered into the town of Donegal. And it was strange because that was a town that had lots of people. It was a place of activity and business, but the streets were bare. And then suddenly he, he heard these peals of laughter coming from the town hall. And he realized, ah, today is the day of the Blarney contest. He said, and that's not a place I'll be going. And he quickly turned around and he was going to exit the town when a couple of his old cronies saw him. And they said, well, Patrick O'Flaherty, Patrick O'Flaherty, it wouldn't be a Blarney contest without you, man. And they, they literally picked him up and they, they pulled him down the street into the hall. And just as the contest was ending, the MC said, well, that's it for the tales. Might there be one other teller of Blarney that hasn't spoken yet? And a shout went up from Patrick's friends, you know, and he said, Patrick O'Flaherty is here. We have to listen to him. And, and the whole crowd said, oh, Patrick, yes, it wouldn't be a Blarney contest without him. And they, they literally pulled him up onto the stage, but he just shook his head and said, I can't do it. I can't spout that kind of stuff any longer. In fact, I can tell nothing but the truth. And he told him the whole story. Of, of what he'd said about the king of the leprechauns and the dream he had and meeting the wee folk and the ring of truth that he wore to this day. And because that he could speak nothing but the truth and couldn't be participating in a Blarney contest because of that. And on and on he went and the whole crowd just fell silent. And as he went to leave the stage, suddenly this, this one person laughed and then another. And someone shouted, Patrick O'Flaherty. <laughs> He's got his hook, line and sinker. Man, that's the best bit of Blarney ever spouted here. We didn't even see it coming, Patrick. A ring of truth, the king of the leprechauns. And he said, no, 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 it's true. The whole thing I told you, it's the absolute truth. You got to believe me. But nobody would. And the judges wouldn't either. And they forced this pouch of gold upon him. And finally, he just, he had to take it. And he took it and he, he went out to that spreading oak tree that very evening and he buried half of it in gratitude to the wee folk. And he took the rest and he lived free from want from that day forward. But he went back to visit the leprechauns and the wee folk many, many times. And after he would go there, he would come to the village of Donegal and he would tell every person there what he'd learned and what he'd seen and, and, and exactly what it was like. And although he said nothing but the absolute unadulterated, unadorned truth, nobody ever believed a word he said. And that's the story of Patrick O'Flaherty, known as the Ring of Truth. And that's adapted from a version written by a wonderful writer, Teresa Bateman. And so, to the Ring of Truth, as all of you, Sancho. <clears throat> well, the main story tonight, uh, true to form, is one of those lengthy twining tales with far too many characters. Um, but I know that I have superior audiences with vast storehouses of memory. And so um, we're going to go for it. Uh, many of you know that uh, in the ancient uh, times in Ireland, a um, few hundred years before uh, St. Patrick ever arrived there, there was a, uh, a band of of warriors who were also poets, and they were known as the Fianna. And the Fianna were led by a man whose name was Finn McCool. And they lived by the old code. And the old code was never, ever give a sword to a man that can't dance. You see, the Fianna knew that there was nothing more intoxicating than bloodshed and warfare, and that unless a man had grace in his bones, unless he had the poems in his heart, compassion in his heart, unless he had the wise tales in his head and in his soul, unless he had all of that, they believed that he could be a good fighter, but he also might never put the sword down because they knew it would be easy to be intoxicated by bloodshed and warfare and to come to love the sound of your own battle cry more than the sound of your own woman wound you home into pillow. 
you could come to love the field of war more than your own hearth fire. And because of that, the men of the Fianna, they knew tomes and tomes of poetry. They knew all the old tales. And beyond that, you see, they say that the men of the Fianna, although they protected the high king from harm and the Irish coast from raids, they were most dedicated to Erin, the goddess of Ireland herself. Because the Fianna lived for half of the year out in the wilds. They hunted and foraged and fished. And many, many people said, it is the men of the Fianna that live closest to the heart of Ireland. For don't they know every deepy, deep and leafy glen? Don't they know every wild mountaintop, every wide fen and singing stream, and every wide strand of beach? For indeed, the men of the Fianna believed that the winds were the holy breath of Erin, the goddess, and the streams her blood and the land her very body. Well, <clears throat> to know the story of Finn McCool, the one I'll tell you tonight, which is called the Spirit of Macmidna, you have to first know the root of Finn McCool, and that was his father, whose name was Camul. Now, before Finn was born, Camul, he was the leader of the Fianna. He was a tremendous fighter. He was a brilliant poet. But the trouble, and doesn't every story need trouble? The trouble for Camul came in love. <laughs> Imagine that, right? He fell in love with this woman whose name was Mourn. And Camul was a, he was a serious sort. He was a, a man of incredible integrity and honesty, uh, but he was also rather sullen. And Mourn was bright and witty and just made him laugh. He just loved to be in her presence. And he knew there could be no other woman for him. And she loved him dearly as well. And so Camul came to Morn's father, whose name was Teg. And Teg was a, was a powerful arch druid to the king. And Camul said, Teg, I've come to ask for permission to marry your daughter Morn, for I, I love her. And I know I could never love any other like I love Morn. And I believe she feels that way to me. And I've come to ask for her hand in marriage. And Teg, this conniving druid, he said, I, Camul, look upon my daughter, the beauty of her, the wit of her. Now there's a woman who is meant for nothing less than a king, not a mere fighting man like yourself, Camul. Now to call Camul the leader of the Fianna and a fine poet, a respected warrior, a mere fighting man, that was like calling a, a marine captain a, a cub scout or something. But time and again, Kamul would come, he humbled himself, and he would ask for Morn's hand. And time and again, Teg insulted him. And so at last, well, Kamul and Morn did what men and women do in such circumstances, right? They ran off, they eloped. And when Teg, Morn's father, heard about this, he was enraged. And when he found out that there was a child swimming around in her womb, a child, no doubt, by Kamul, he went to the high king and he said, now you listen to me. You send out the army and you bring him back and my daughter as well, for he's gone against my will. Well, now you have to understand, the arch druid was a powerful person. And the high king, whose name was, who, whose name was Khan of a hundred battles, he listened to the druid and he sent out the army to capture Kamul. Now you need to know this distinction. The Fianna was a band of warrior poets. At times they would help the king, but they weren't the army. They lived independently by their own means. They only supported the king if they believed his cause was just. And so the king sent his army to bring Kamul back. And when the men of the Fianna discovered that this army was going out to capture their leader, they went out to support him. Well, you could see him now. About 800 of the king's men upon one ridge line. And then there was a valley, and on the other side, there was about 200 of the men of the Fianna. And it was then that Camul went to his, his best friend, who was also his captain and the most ferocious fighter of the Fianna, whose name was Fakale. And Camul said to Fakale, you listen to me now. You take all the men of the Fianna away, because no blood is going to be shed on my behalf. This is not a matter for themselves. This is a, a fight between myself and the high king and the druid Teg. 
take the man of the Fianna away now. And for Kale, he said, you listen to me now, brother. This isn't just your fight. Morn went away with you willingly. And for some reason, she seems to like you, you sullen bastard. And if she didn't like you, you'd have asked to answer for it, and you know it. But now listen to me, Kamor. If a woman can't marry the man she loves, and if a man can't marry the woman she loves, and if a conniving bastard like Tag the Druid can squeeze the nuts of the High King and turn the whole army against a man like yourself, we're all bloody buggered and you know it. We're not living in a world like that. We're fighting against it. Ah, Kamul said, Fakail, brother, those are lovely words, but you're fucking daft. Look out, would you, man? There's 800 of the king's men out there. There's 200 of us at best. Fakail said, I know that and it weighs on me, but is it my fault if the king didn't bring enough men? Ha, 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 ha. Come on, Kamul, let's have at it. Well, you need to know that the men of the Fianna, as I've said, they were poets, dancers, widely educated men of cultivated heart, and yet they were ferocious warriors. They lived most of their lives out of doors. They had the strength, the wiles, the instinct of wild animals. They trained constantly, and they had dozens and dozens of strategies for dispatching of their enemies in the most imaginative and efficacious of ways. And so the battle was fought. It was called the Battle of Kanaka. And after the Battle of Kanaka was fought, indeed, a hundred of the Fianna lay dead and 700 of the king's men lay dead. But the tide of the battle had turned and Kamul knew that the Fianna had to escape to live to fight another day. And he called out to his friend Fakail, said, Fakail, take the men now, away with you, hide now. So you might survive. And Fakail listened. And in that moment, Kamul gave to Fakail his spear. And Fakail took the men of the Fianna and away they went to live as outlaws for a long time after that. But, but Kamul stayed. He decided that he would face whatever justice the High King would mete out. But what he hadn't counted on was this. There was there an arch rival an arch rival who was fighting that day against Kamul. And the arch rival's name was Gaul Mac Morna. Gaul means one eyed. And Gaul Mac Morna was a ferocious fighter. But they would say of Gaul Mac Morna, he fights against everything and he fights for nothing. But the one thing he always wanted was to have leadership of the Fianna. And now he used this moment to take it. As he had his henchmen attack Kamul, Gaul McMorna came in from behind and with his spear, he just thrust it right through into the heart of Kamul. And that proud and noble and good leader of the Fianna lay dead. It was then Gaul McMorna took a sword, severed his head, took the head of Kamul to the high king and said, I've brought you the head of Kamul. And now I'll be taking the rest of what belonged to him, the leadership of the Fianna. And the strangest thing in the world was this. At that moment that Gaul McMorna took leadership of the Fianna, Morn, the beloved of Kamul, gave birth to a man-child. A man-child who would grow up to have a fair spirit and fair hair, and because of that they would call him Finn McCool. And when Gaul McMorna discovered that Morn had given birth to a man-child. He knew that this child would grow up to be like Kamul and probably with some deadly additions. And so he came to dispatch him as an infant. And Morn was as cunning as she was wise. She went to her father to ask for protection. But Tag the Druid said, you've made your bed, woman, and now you'll sleep in it. You've shamed my house. You've shamed myself. Away with you. Moore now with an infant in her arms, she turned to her sister, Bovmil, who was a druidess. And she turned to her best friend, Leith Lucra, who was a warrior and a teacher of warriors. For there was a long tradition of women warriors in Ireland. 
And if you've ever really known an Irish woman, you'll know that's not much a stretch. But these three women, they were at home in the woods and the wilds and the trackless places. So quickly and swiftly, they spirited Finn McCool, this infant, away into the most remote wild parts of the mountains known as Sliv Bloom. And it was there they built a small hunting bothy, a shelter of, of, of mud and wattle and stick and timber. And they disguised it so perfectly, people said you could walk within 10 steps of it and not know it was there. And shortly after they arrived and made their home there, Moore and she picked up her infant son, kissed him on the forehead, and bade him farewell. And then she turned to her sisters and she said, I must get myself away now because I need to get Gal McMorna off our track. And I need to find allies for this boy. For if the Fianna is ever to have a leader again worthy of its name, it will be this child. And she said, Bovmil's sister, give him your wisdom, give him your words, give him the poems and the tales Make him wise, draw his language for. And Leith Lucra, teach him to fight, teach him to hunt, and spare him no pain. And you make sure that he knows that wherever he lays his head, in all of Ireland, that will be his home. And with that, her sister said, Mourn. We know that this is your son, but he is also our life now. We understand that. Be at peace, woman, and away with you. And they embraced their sister, and away she went. And if you don't know how it was that Finn had his infancy and boyhood and part of his youth there in Sleep Bloom, but how he had to flee, if you don't know that, you have to listen to this next part of the story. And you will. Slancha. They say that Finn McCool was raised far from the society of men. His first lullabies were the songs of the rain against the Bothy, the sound of the night birds and the owls. His first companions were, were every creature that slithered and swam and flew and hopped and ran. And in no time, he, he knew their tracks and their sounds and their ways. By the time Finn McCool was four, they say he could climb trees like a squirrel. He could swim like a fish. At age five, he began to bring rabbits home. Well, meat for the pot anyway, from the snares that he made. Of course, Bob Mail, the Druidus, and Leith Lucra, the fighter, they, they were as devoted in their love to him as they were merciless in their training of him. When he was three, Leith Lucre used to run after him with a switch, striking at the backs of his legs and forcing him to flee and hide and run. And then in time, he was striking her and he was giving much better than he got. Above Mel in the evenings, she would give to him the tales and the poems of his father, teach him to sing, make tags of rhyme. And so it was, he grew. But as he grew, he began to track farther and wider away from the Bothy. By the time he was 12, he would be on the track of red deer and wild boar. Because Finn could go far from the Bothy and find his way home by moonlight or starlight or no light at all. But you know how it is. Even in the most remote places, there are people that do wander by, aren't there? You know, cow herds in search of a lost cow shepherds in search of lost sheep. And sometimes they would see this stout, fair-haired, stalwart lad traipsing swiftly through the woods. And oftentimes with a brace of, of ducks in his hands or, or a red deer upon his shoulder. And in time didn't word spread about this fair-haired, stalwart lad living in sleeve bloom. And word came and went from ear to ear to ear. And finally, Indeed, it came to the ears of Gall McMorna, that one who had murdered Finn's father, that one who had a pretty good idea of who some fair-haired stalwart boy living in the 
wilds of sleeve bloom just might be. And he came for her. It was of an evening. Above Mail the Druidess, she was preparing the cooking fire. And she looked in to the fire and she, <gasps> she jumped back and she shuddered because she had the gift of the second sight and she could see in the flames the shapes of men. And she knew these men weren't far away. And she knew they were coming to the Bothy with no good intent in their hearts. And she said, Finn, boy, come here now, now. She said, now you listen to me. What has been our secret is a secret no longer. We have been found out. Gal McMorna and his men are coming for, for you. Now, Finn, you must get yourself away and swiftly Go far from the mountains of Slid Bloom. Find a king, find a lord there. Hunt for him, track for him. Do what you do best. Become useful to him. We will find you in time. But listen now. While you are away in the wide world, never ever use the name Finn McCool. To use your name could mean your death. Use only the name, the sweet name your mother gave you when you were born, which is Devna. You only use the name Devna. What name do you use, Finn? And he said, I use the name Devna now. Good boy. Away. And just like that, Finn McCool, he embraced this, these ants who had, taught him every, who had taught him everything. And into the night, he went swiftly. And sure enough, not long after first light, Gaul McMorna and his men, they came to the Bothy. They searched high and low all around it. They found no track of Finn. But what they did find was, was two rather daft women in the Bothy, because Leith Lucra and Bob Mill could be excellent actors. And Bob Mill said, well, the boy, you know, he, I, he left early this morning and he's probably out hunting the dogs, you know, but, but he'll be back by noon with a brace of them for sure. Men, 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 why don't you sit here and wait for him? And while you're waiting, why don't you grease your knives upon this? And didn't she put a fine roast of venison right before them? And the men, cold and hungry, no doubt they sat and they ate and they passed time. And as they passed time there, Finn McCool gained distance between himself and those that would harm him, between his old life and his new, between a world of which he knew everything and a world of which he knew no one or nothing. And if you don't know how he was soon in even deeper trouble with a sword at his throat, well, you have to listen to this next part of the tale. Finn McCool traveled only at night now. In the days, he slept in the coverts and the caves. He foraged for his food. Finn was alone, but he would be alone much of his life. And he was suited, they say, for solitude, the way the solitary crane loves the solitude of the bog and the swamp and the marsh. But at last, when he was far, far away from Sleeve Bloom, he began to walk during the days. And it was then that he... He fell in with a band of youth, a band of boys his own age. There must have been a dozen or more of them. And they were returning, having studied with the Druids of one tribe. They were returning through the Galti Mountains to their home. For you see, in those days in Ireland, there was a system known as fosterage. And in that system, the youth of one tribe, or Twath as it was called, they would go and they would live and they would study for a season or more with another tribe because it was understood that every tribe had its own teachers, its own druids, its own ways and its own wisdoms. And in that way, the wisdom of one tribe became the wisdom of many. And also through that, there were alliances and allegiances and friendships and fealty formed. And in that way, the far flung tribes were, were woven together so that when conflict inevitably did rise, it could usually be solved with words and not with weapons. There was a band of boys there moving down the path and Finn fell in with them and he was mightily impressed with them because they had been studying with the, the Druids who knew history and didn't they have tales of, of kings and battles and all the stuff of the living world and he had been raised there in the hills of Sliv Bloom. But they were not unimpressed with Finn for he too could make poems and he too knew tales. And he was more at home in the wilds than they would ever be. One afternoon, 
they came to a knoll, a wooded knoll overlooking a vast, vast fen, a marsh, because Ireland, a lowland country, was filled with marshes like that. They were vast wastelands, avoided by all and sundry, because they were dangerous places where you could be lost. They were avoided by all and sundry, they say, except for those who wanted to avoid all and sundry. They were making a camp upon this knoll and Finn said, I'm off now. I'm gonna set snares to see if we might have meat for tonight or the morrow. And away he went, but he hadn't been gone long when he heard screams and shouts cries of alarm and he came running back to see some enormous man this huge warrior with a huge spear and he was forcing his companions to give up what pouches of coins they had and rings and anything of value they had and Finn crept up from behind and he leapt upon this giant of a man and he pounded at him and fought him and he used every trick Leith Lucra had taught him and in that way he gave his friends time to escape which they did and Finn, he, he, could, he could dodge and weave and, and he could strike some blows, but this man, he was a warrior. And in time, Finn found himself on his back, the warrior's foot upon his chest and his spear right to his throat. This huge giant, he said, now you tell me or I'll run you through. Who are you, boy? And who taught you to fight like that? Now, Finn knew, remember, he couldn't speak his name. If he did, that could mean his death. But he figured, well, he was about to die anyway, and he wasn't going to go to his death without speaking his name. And so he looked at this huge man, and he said, I'll tell you who I am. My name is Finn McCool. I'm the son of Camul, who was once the leader of the Fianna. And ten times the fighter you are, you bloody fucking coward. And then Finn waited for the spear to pierce his neck and waited for his own hot blood to flow from him. And he waited and waited and waited, but it didn't happen. In fact, something far different did happen. He looked up to see this giant of a man just sort of rocking back and forth like he was in a trance. And then this giant, he fell to his knees, put his hand in his head, put his head in his hands, rather. He put his head in his hands and he began to weep. He began to weep like a child. And then this man, he, he pulled Finn up by the shirt. And he looked at Finn through these teary eyes. And he said, your father, Kamul, he was my captain and my best friend. I was with him the day he died at Kanaka. My name is Fakail. And it is a good omen that the son of Kamul is alive and well. This is a good omen for the Fianna and for all of Ireland. You come with me, boy. There are men who need to know you. Well, you might say Finn was a bit reluctant at first to go with this man who seemed quite ready to run him through with a spear. But, but he could tell there was something he could trust in this man. And just like that. Fakale took Finn and they, they left the, the wooded knoll and they went right into this deep fen. And for hours they pushed through the bulrushes and walked through shallow creeks and around this way and around that way and over logs. And finally they came to the edge of a wide, wide, wide lake. And across it, you could see an island there with oak and willow trees growing down to the water. And Fakale, he moved the rushes away and revealed a, a rowboat called a kurok the kind of a boat that's made by stretching animal skins over a wicker frame. They're, they're sleek and fast and light. And just like that, Fakale was rowing Finn across this wide fetch of water. And they passed beneath this curtain of willows that grew down to the water. And Finn beheld an amazing sight. For there, among the the oaks and in the clearings, there were dozens and dozens of well-made bothies shelter of timber and branch, cooking fires. There was industry and activity everywhere. There were men that were, they were skinning deer, men sharpening knives, men mending nets, building kuroks, building bothies, activity everywhere. And Fakale said, behold, Finn, 
These are all the men that fought with your father at Kanaka. This is the remnants of the Fianna. We've been living like outlaws in this bog ever since that battle, hounded constantly by Gal McMorna and the king's men. Just as Fakale brought Finn into the camp, you might say the industry and activity came to a halt because the men looked to see a stranger come into camp. And they didn't know whether it was a good omen or a bad, but these men were not used to good news. And they all gathered around a hundred or so men. And Fakale said, behold, men, this is a whelp before me who was trained in battle by none other than Leith Lucra, was given words of wisdom by none other than Bavmil the Druidus. And the men's eyes brightened, for they knew of these women. And then he said, Behold, men, the son of Moorn and our leader, Kamul, welcome into this camp, Finn McCool. Well, the men, I can't tell you, gave up a, a cheer of happiness but it was almost like a weight felt like it was lifted, dropped away from them. And as they looked at this stalwart lad, they, they realized that perhaps it was a good omen. Perhaps the winds of fate would be blowing at their backs now, blowing them towards a destiny that was a bit greater than simply being brigands hiding out in a bog. But so it was that Finn McCool began his training in earnest with the men of the Fianna. And that was no small thing. Because you see, to be initiated into the Fianna, you had to fend off nine spears thrown at you with nothing more than a hazel wand. You had to fly through the woods, running swiftly without even breaking a twig. You had to as well be able to leap over a branch as high as your head beneath one, no higher than your, your knee. You had to be able to know the poems and the tales to speak with eloquence before a king. Build a bothy, build a karak track red deer, wild boar. You had to be able to set a bone, mend a wound. You had to respect women and strike fear in the hearts of foes. The training, you might say, was rigorous, but Finn loved it. And in time, day after day, the men would come to him, sometime by themselves, sometime in pairs, groups of three or four, and they would welcome him and tell him the stories of his father. And at last he felt that he was at home with these uncles, with these brothers, but they were relentless in their training of him. And seasons passed in that way. Finn's favorite times were the days of the hunt. Usually a couple of bands of about 10 men would leave the Bothy before dawn. They would go and they would arrive at the low-lying hills beyond the fen. The dogs would be loosed and the hunt would begin. And in no time at all, of course, the dogs, they found fresh game. And the men just flew behind them as fast as they could. By noon, usually, some of the other men, they went further ahead to find a place with adequate water and, and firewood. And in that place, they would, they would dig a large pit. And then they would take stones. They would build fires, they would heat the stones and line the pit with the stones. And then when the hunters arrived, they would take the meat and wrap them in sedges and grasses and put them upon the stones and cover that with earth. Farmers to this day uncover such places. They're known as the ovens of the Fianna. But as the meat was cooking, the men, they would bathe themselves, wash, clean themselves, build simple shelters, and then eat their dinner in silence. But it was after that that came the time that Finn loved most. Because that was the time of the making up of the poems and the telling of tales and the songs. And what he loved too was the fact that the men, they respected each other so well. And they loved each other so dearly. They insulted each other mercilessly. And laughter just reverberated through the hills. And at such times as well, Finn learned tales of his father, and at times he could feel him close by his heart. Season upon season passed, and Finn McCool grew in strength, grew in stature, grew in knowledge, and grew in wisdom. And one day, they took him to a place he'd never been to before. It was a wide meadow, and in the middle of the meadow, there was a, a stout oak tree. And as they approached the tree, Finn could see that there was a, a spear 
that was bound to this tree. And as he approached, he could see the spear had a life of its own. It was trying to pull itself away from the tree, but was bound up tightly to it. And Finn said, what is that? Just a spear of amazing craftsmanship, but I've never seen such a thing. It appears that it wants to break free. And his mentor, Fakeo, said, behold, Finn, this is known as the Spear of Macmidna. It was forged in the hollow hills by the greatest of the smiths. And it was made for one reason, boy, killing. It never misses a mark. And I dare say killing is its, its art and its pleasure. And when there is no other recourse, when that is the work that must be done, there is no greater ally than that spear. And there is no greater danger to us and to all of Ireland and this world than that spear. For if a warrior spear is not bound up to something ancient and strong and noble and wise and rooted deeply, it'll break free and make mayhem for the sheer fucking music of it. Now you listen to me, Finn. Every man of the Fianna has a spear like that in him. And every man here to be a member of the Fianna has found a way to temper it, has found something to hold on to it. Because you see, that spear is inside of us. And unless we too are bound up to something ancient and wise and noble and true and right, we too will break free and make mayhem for the music of it. Now you listen to me, Finn. As far as a fighter, as far as a man who can bring fire, we've seen nothing better than yourself. But now your training is only half done. Because Finn McCool, to be a member of the Fianna, you have to know how to stop a battle, not just to start one. You have to know the ways of water, not just the ways of fire. And we believe that it would be best if you left us now and went out and traveled the great river Boyne, where you might find the great poet Finnecas and study with him because his knowledge is ancient. And if you could learn from him the ways of water and the ways of compassion and the ways of soul, you might learn what you need to become a member of the Fianna. For you see, without that, a fighter you may be, but never a man, never a man of the Fianna. But listen to me, Finn. You have men at your back now. You're not alone any longer. And though you won't see us, we'll be keeping an eye out for you. Away with you now, boy. And just like that, Finn, he, he was embraced by Finnecost. All of the men came towards him, embraced him, gave him their best. And just like that, all of these men, these uncles, these brothers, these friends now, he left. He left and he wandered from the bogs up into the heights to the very headwaters of the River Boyne for he was going to walk the whole length of it to find that poet Finnecost. And if you don't know if he found him and found the finned one named Finton, well, you have to listen to this part of the story. Just launch you. Uh, Finn McCool knew the tide of his own life was changing now, for he had been trained in arms and trained in fire and trained in discipline. And he reached the headwaters of the Boyne, and you need to know that long ago there was no River Boyne. There was only a deep spring, some call it a, a, a well, and he had to look way down to find the water. It was a very, very special place. And in those days, there was a goddess by the name of Bowen. What did they call her? They called her Bowen, indeed because there was always a goddess traipsing around somewhere in Ireland. And this god, goddess Bowen, she was a curious woman, you know. And uh, she would sometimes make her way up, up, up the hills. And when she would come close to this well, some king or some druid or some poet would say, oh, Bowen, you're not allowed there. Don't be looking into the well. It could cause great destruction. She always found some man to mansplain something to her about the well, you know. But of course, what do you think she did? She went to it. She gazed down deep into it. And they say, when the spirit of the waters looked up and saw this woman, it just came roaring right after her. 
And as it did, bone, she fled from the mountains down and down and down. And as she ran, the waters, they flew right after her. And upon that circuitous route that she ran, the waters followed. And when she meets the sea, meet the, met the sea, she could look behind her. And there was this beautiful ribbon of life named after Bowen, which today we call the River Boyne. And it was upon those waters, that river, that Finn was walking down mile upon mile, day upon day upon day, and he loved it. He would stop and, and think and, and brood and bathe in the deep pools. He'd listen to the singing of the, of the rapids and the waterfalls, and on and on he went. But one day, he looked down and he saw upon this knoll, this little knoll overlooking the deepest pool of the River Boyne, he saw this little hut, smoke curling from it, you know. And then he saw this ancient man. And, and, and this little man, he was like a little bundle of sticks with a robe around him, you know, and Finn was watching him. He was picking his way down from the hut down to the water with a net. And he would cast it out and pull it in and cast it out and pull it in, cast it out and pull it in. And Finn walked down and he, he addressed him. He said, sir, sir, gr gr greetings. I, I, I am told that there's a wise and venerable poet who lives upon the banks of the River Boyne, and I was wondering if that might be yourself, sir. And the old poet, he said, well, if it was me, what would that mean to you, son? Uh, that would mean everything, sir. For, for you see, I'm under the leadership, the authority of the Fianna, and they've trained me in arms and in weapons and in the ways of fire, but they said that I'm truly to be a member of the Fianna. I must learn how to stop battles, not just start one. I must need to know the ways of water, not just the ways of fire. I must need to, to know the old poems and the old tales, not just how to fight, but why did I fight? Well, if I was that old poet and if I was to teach you, what would you give to me, son? And Finn said, I, I would give everything, sir. I would, I would tend to your fires. I would, I would cook for you. I would, I would hunt for you. I would mend your nets. I would fish for you. I would, I would change the rushes out in the bothy. I would rebuild the bothy, sir, if required. And Finnecos could see that this lad was hungry for the knowledge. And he said, tell me, boy, what is your name? And of course, wasn't Finn traveling in the wide world now? And he said, my name, sir, is tis Devna. Ah, well then, Devna. I am Finnecos. Let us begin. And so it was, they began and by day Finn did everything that he said he would do. He, he hunted and fished and cooked. And by night Finnecos would give him the magic of wor words and meter and rhythm and rhyme. He taught him the ancient poems. He told him the oldest stories. But then he would say, tomorrow Finn, you go out to the river boy in a mile upstream. You sit and see if you can't catch a poem from those waters. And the next day, now make up a poem about the father that you never knew. And the next week, you'll tell me the story of Manon McLear, the one that I told you, but you'll tell it in your own way, with your own words. Now, boy, do that. And Finn realized in time that his training in poems was more rigorous than his training in arms, because it was the muscle of his own heart that was being stretched. And at times it would crack and break, and he would weep. Pentecost would say, let the tears come, boy. They wash away the past and they water what's new and to come. Let the tears come. And so it was, season upon season, with the poems and the tales and the teachings of Pentecost and, and the waters of the Boyne always talking to him. Those waters and those poems, it, it seemed to seep right through Finn McCool, to crack him, to open him to make his thinking wise and fluid and subtle. But one day, while he was clearing out the rushes in the bothy, he heard a cry of alarm, a shout, and he went running out, and there was the poet Finnecos. He was in the boyne with an enormous fish in the net, but the fish was pulling the poet into the water, rather than the poet pulling the fish out of the water. But Finn ran down, he waded in, and now the two of them, they pulled this enormous salmon out of the waters onto the grassy banks. And Finnecos said, look at that fish, boy. 
That's the fish I've been fishing for for seven long years. And Finn said, you've been fishing seven years for one fish? And of course, any steelhead fisherman can understand what that's like. Right? He said, fishing seven years for one fish? And Finnegas said, Devna, this isn't just any fish. This is the salmon of wisdom. It's been swimming around the deepest well in the deepest ocean for years and years and years. And it's been eating of the sacred hazelnuts of knowledge. And they say that the man who catches that fish and eats one bite of it would have knowledge of past and present and even see the shapes of the future. Now listen to me, Devna. I'm weary, I'm cold. Take the fish, build a fire, put a spit through the fish and turn it slowly and cook it and call me when it's ready, but, but don't be taking any of the fish, son. And Finn said, I would never do that, sir. You know that. I would never do that. I know you wouldn't, Devna. Good boy. And Finnecost went off and he rested. And Finn, he did as he was told. He built a fine fire. And when the coals were just right, he, he put a spit right through it and began to turn it slowly, slowly, slowly. And some say perhaps he got distracted. But I say, sometimes cooking a fish is just like this. The flames will rise up because the oil is hot. And didn't he notice a blister rising upon the skin of the fish? And Finn thought, oh no, no, that won't be right. Finnecas, he, he won't like that. And, and he took his thumb and he smoothed out the blister. But as he did, of course, it popped and hot salmon oil scalded his thumb. And Finn McCool did what anyone would do without even thinking. He just... He popped it into his mouth, and when he did, the wisdom just shot right through. And he cried out. He felt a knowledge in him, a knowing himself in himself, a strength and an insight he'd never had before. And Finnecas, he heard something. He came running out, and he took one look and said, Devna, what have you done? Have you eaten the fish? Finn said, sir, I, I, I didn't, but... But I pressed the blister and the blister popped in salmon oil. It scalded me. I put, I put my thumb in, in, in my mouth just, just to cool it. But, but, sir, I believe I've gained that knowledge that was meant for yourself. Finnegas said, tell me something. <clears throat> Devna, are you ever called by any other name? And Devna said, well, sir, I, I am called by, by, by some who know me as Finn because of my fair hair. And the old poet said, oh, no, tis perfect, boy. For you see, it was prophesied long ago that a man by the name of Finn would catch the fish and gain that knowledge. And, well, you know, I thought myself, being the name Finnecost, it was perhaps meant for me, but uh, it's meant for you, son. Each and every morsel of it. And didn't Finnecost, the elder, take the fish and just give it to Finn? You take it, boy. All the knowledge and all the nourishment is just meant for yourself, son. And so the wise Finnecas gave to Finn the fish who gained that knowledge. And not long after that, Finnecas said, I've taught you what I can, son. And you know now how to stop a battle, not just start one. You got the poems in your heart, the tales in your brain. And it's time for you, Finn McCool, to get yourself deeper into the world and find the trouble that you were meant for. For life is trouble, boy. But you have to find the trouble you were meant for. Now listen to me. The time of Samhain is coming on. Halloween, that's time. And it means that everyone can travel freely throughout all of Ireland. You must, must get yourself to the principal Dunfort at Tara. Because the High King, Connor of a Hundred Battles, he'll be calling the Fianna back from all the places far and wide. And they'll be there. And you need to know this. Every Samhain evening, there's been a curse upon the Dunfort for nine long years. And every Samhain evening, there's a powerful bard, a dark bard, whose name is Alian. And he plays a set of pipes so sweetly that the music puts everyone to sleep, from the stoutest warrior to the oldest washerwoman. And when they're all asleep, he summons fire right out of the same pipes and they burn away the roof of the dun, all the timber and all the thatch. It's exposing all of that to the winds of the winter and the weather. And it's just a great embarrassment to the king and even greater to the Fianna. 
for anyone who's tried to stop it has been turned to ash. And I say this, Finn, if there is a man who could break the curse, defeat Olyan, so that he would never trouble the Dunfort and Tara again, that would be a man who could claim what he wanted. That would be a man who could claim his destiny. So the question is always this, Finn, will you be a man of destiny? Or just a man blown about by the fates of this world? You know what you need to do, Finn. Get yourself to Tara. Take this with you, boy. And just like that, Finnecas, he took off his deeply, beautifully woven cloak and he put it around Finn. And he said, away with you now, boy. And Finn looked at his ancient mentor who'd given him so much. He thanked him for every blessing he'd been given, every boon he'd been given. And then he turned and he left that sweet valley of the Boyne that he loved so much. And in time, he could no longer hear the rippling of the waters, that voice that was always with him. In time, the pathless places led to trails and tracks. And at times, he fell in with other travelers on the road then to Tara. And if you don't know how Finn met fire and regained leadership of the Fianna, you have to listen to this final part of the tale, which is the smallest part, but it is the hub upon which the whole wheel turns. It's not you. Finn used the cloak of the poet and the hood that it had on, to, on, on top of it to hide himself, to fall in with others as he traveled. He made his way to the great Dun Fort. Now you need to know this, a Dun Fort was always built into the side of a great hill. And then the roof was always timber and beams and thatch and such. And Finn made his way into the Dunfort. And he could see at the feasting table, there was King Connor of a hundred battles. And there were the men of the Fianna. And seated not far from the king, there was Gaul McMorna, the very man who had murdered his father, one-eyed Gaul McMorna. And Finn waited and waited. And when the moment seemed right, way from the edge of the crowd, he stood up. And he pulled back the hood and he looked directly at the king, who after a while saw Finn staring at him. Who is this young whelp who stands before me now? And Finn said, King Connor of a hundred battles. Indeed, I may be a, a whelp, I may be a dog, but I am not some worthless bitch like the man who leads the Fianna now. And all of a sudden, everyone turned, and the men of the Fianna rose, for their leader had been insulted. And the king said, wait, who are you, boy? I am Finn McCool, the son of Camul, who was murdered. And I've came, come to claim what is rightly mine, leadership of the Fianna. And the king said, your father was respected in this hall, but the Fianna has a leader. Tis Gal McMorna. And Finn said, indeed, it does. But tomorrow, King, will the Dunfort at Tara have a roof over its head? Or will the leader of the Fianna slumber once again and snore through it and allow the dark barred Alien to leash flame upon it? I say this much, that I go out and I meet that bard and I defeat that curse. And if I do so, I claim what is rightly mine, leadership of the Fianna. And the King said, well, is there any other here willing to make that claim? And no one spoke, for all knew what would happen, facing Ollie and the Dark Bard. But the king said, Gal McMorna, if this man does such a thing, you will follow him. And Gal said, oh, I will. I'll follow his charred bones to the very end. And of course, everyone laughed. But Finn went out at dusk, and he slowly began to patrol around the great Dunfort. And he found a rise from which he could see everything. And he sat in that place and he waited and he waited. And then he heard a rustling in the brush. And he took a sword and just as he turned, he, ah, he could see his, he could see his, his mentor, his friend, Fakail, coming towards him. And Fakail said, didn't I tell you? Men would have an eye out after you. We thought you might be needing this. 
and with that he presented him with the spear of Machmidna. This is a spear your father used. It didn't always know victory, but it always knew valor. Keep the blade of it near your head. Pull the hood off it. The stench of it will keep you awake. Take it, boy. And Finn took this spear. And Fakale went away. And Finn waited and waited and waited. And of course, the music at last came. The sweetest music you've ever known. It rose out of the earth. And soon all were fast asleep. And you need to know that Finn McCool, he was a mortal man. And he couldn't help himself. He too fell asleep. But when he did, the spear that he held, it fell. And it just so happened that the flat of the blade turned and, 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 and banged him right upon the head. And the stench in the blade and the sound in the spear itself called out to him, Fen McCool, you are the point of the spear now. Wake up! And he woke up. And he took the spear, and just at that moment, he looked about, and a flame of fire shot out of Allian's pipe right towards the Dunfort. But Finn knew what to do. He raised the spear, and he was able to catch the fire and drew it right down to the earth. And though it scorched the earth, it didn't harm the Dunfort. And time and time again, Allian brought flame, and time and time again, Finn met it with that spear. And at long last, as the night wore on, Olian, this dark bard, knew that he had to retreat. And as he did, Finn followed him. But Olian McMidna, he was of the she, of the fairy folk. And he could shift his shape, which he did. And Finn followed as best he could. But by first light, he had lost him. He came upon a knoll and he looked down. And sure enough, there was Olian about ready to slip into a into a cavern in the earth, which would, would close right behind him. And Finn knew he would come back in another year's time. And that's when he felt the spear just tugging and tugging and tugging away, longing to do its work. And in that moment, Finn raised it. And with all his strength, he just let it fly. And they say it shrieked and sang as it whistled through the air, and just as Ollie and the bard entered the earth, the spear entered him. And all together, spear and the dark bard and the curse itself fell into the earth that closed behind them. And from that day forward, none of those things ever troubled Ireland again. And just as all of those things had returned from where they'd come. Finn decided to return from where he'd come. He returned back to the Dunfort at Tara and he opened the door and there were all the men just <laughs> snoring away. And Finn made his way to the king's chamber and, and he roused King Connor of a hundred battles from his sleep. And he said, King, what is it you see above your head? And the king, he said, what are you, what? And he looked up, he says, ah, look at that. It is the roof of the dun. And Finn said, and so who is it you see before you now? And the king understood, he sat up and he looked at Finn and he said, I'll tell you who I see before me now. I see Finn McCool. I see the son of Morn and the son of Camul. And I see the new leader of the Fianna before me now. And so it was that Finn McCool regained leadership of the Fianna that had been lost to his father. And the first thing he did was he went to Gaul McMorna to make peace with him, to forgive him for the murder of his father. And Gaul McMorna served him long and well after that time. The next thing he did was to send word out to all the men of the Fianna in the bogs and the marshes in hiding and they came back, and so the finest men swelled the ranks of the Fianna. And they say that as the leader of the Fianna, Finn McCool and that band, they ushered in an age of such sweetness in Ireland and glory. It was an age when the making of poems was more important than the making of wars. 
and the greatest warriors were also the greatest poets. And they also lived closest to the heart of Ireland. For they knew that the winds were the holy breath of Erin, and the streams her blood and the body, the earth her body. And so it was, or so the story says it was, but then again, it's just a story. But as a great Irish poet once said, stories and poems, they're utterly useless, but they just might save your life. That I don't know, but I do know this much. It is all of you that have helped me bring the story of Finn McCool and the Spear of Macmidna and the wise fish and the venerable poet and the men of the Fianna to life here tonight. And I thank you for your patience and your generosity to all of you and to the ancients who brought these tales to us. Sláinte. <laughs> and so we finish with a traditional song. Um, and don't worry, it's not very long. Um, some people said, well, we would pay you money to sing that traditional song. And a lot more people say, well, we would pay you money not to sing at all. But um, that's why I like to sing usually with a lot of people. Anyway, this is a song sung often at partings, whether it's a funeral uh, or just the end of an evening at a pub, and it's called The Parting Glass. Sing along with me if you know it. Ah, of all the money that e'er I had, I spent it in good company. And all the harm that e'er I done, alas, it was to none but me. And all I've done for want of wit, to memory now I can't recall, so fill to me the parting glass. Good night and joy be with you all. Of all the comrades that e'er I had, they're sorry for me going away. And all the sweethearts that e'er I had, with a couple notable exceptions, they'd wish me one more day to stay. But since it falls unto my lot, that I should rise and you should not, well, I'll gently rise and softly call. Good night and joy be with you all. Good night and joy be with you all. Thanks for coming, everybody. Slancha, happy St. Patty's Day. <laughs>